Marco! Type hello in the comments section and welcome to Kono's Crash Course! If it wasn't already clear, this video is on Marco Polo, so let's get started! Marco Polo lived from 1254 to 1324, and this puts him between the 13th and the 14th century. Now, Dr. T gave a lot of explaining on how historians placed people who lived in multiple centuries, but he never specified which one to use for Marco Polo. So if you know which century we're supposed to use for Marco Polo, please tell me in the comments below. That would help a lot of people out. Marco Polo's dad, Niccolo Polo, and uncle, Mafio Polo, were both merchants, and they left Marco as a kid in Venice to travel around on the Silk Road. And so yeah, Niccolo Polo, Mafio Polo, Silk Road, those are all important things and I'll get into more detail about them as we go on. So I believe Marco was left with his aunt, I don't know what his mom was doing, and so yeah, Niccolo and Mafio, they were traveling on the Silk Road as merchants. The Silk Road is a path between Europe and the Far East, and it's referred to as the Overland Route. It's 3,000 miles long and it's a dangerous journey, there are a bunch of Muslim raiders and a bunch of bad stuff along the way. The journey took 17 years, and while on the journey, they were approached by a messenger of the Mongolian leader Kublai Khan. He's an important figure. Kublai Khan requested their presence, and they went to his palace in China, specifically Beijing. And Kublai Khan had a huge empire at this point. It was comprised of not only China, but also Korea and a big chunk of India. Kublai asked Niccolo and Mafio to deliver a letter to the Pope for them, and so they obeyed and they delivered the letter. After delivering the letter, they returned to Venice where Marco Polo was waiting for them, and he was 15 when they returned, but, but they were gone for 17 years, and he was 15 when they got back. Uh, I think the math is wrong here. Anyway, Marco's mom died while they were gone. I don't know where she was the rest of the time, because... If he was living with his aunt, where was his mom? Marco then joined Niccolo and Mafio on their journey back to China, and it took a couple of years for them to return, but eventually they made it, and Marco met Kublai Khan, and there he revealed the purpose of the letter to the Pope. It was a request to send 100 missionaries to China, and he wished for the missionaries to train them, because Khan's mom was a Christian, and so was one of his four wives, so Khan kind of wanted to, I guess, embrace the Christian culture. He also bestowed to Marco a golden tablet, which is a very important item. It gave him and his crew access to the whole Mongol Empire. If they showed the golden tablet to any citizen, that person was obliged to give them whatever they needed for free. So it was almost like a VIP pass. Basically, just show that to someone and they can do whatever you want. I want a golden tablet. Marco acted as an ambassador for Kublai Khan as he went around, and Marco Polo was also a great storyteller. The Mongols loved his tales of all his adventures throughout his travels, and Kublai Khan would not let Marco leave for a while because he was just so awesome, and he only let Marco leave to escort a princess, which I guess is a worthy cause. However, on the way home, they got captured, because like I said, the Silk Road is a very dangerous place. And while in prison, a writer began writing down Marco's stories, and this became a book called The Travels of Marco Polo, which is an important book. It was basically a collection of all his stories. It's now considered a valuable travel book for explorers. Uh, Christopher Columbus used it, but it wasn't that helpful, so... Uh... And when Marco got home, he began sharing his stories, and nobody believed him. He talked about outlandish things that the Mongols supposedly had, like, like ice cream! Yeah, yeah, this supposed ice cream. That, that, that's nonsense. The ice cream. What, what in the world is that? You must be making stuff up, Marco. He also brought back gunpowder from China, which they used for fireworks. But Marco never mentioned the Great Wall, which was 5,000 miles long, and somehow he missed it. And he also didn't mention foot binding or tea or chopsticks, which were all common things in China at this time. But Marco seemed to completely miss them. It became a saying to say someone is telling a Marco Polo when they're telling a lie, and that's so sweet. You just associate the guy with telling lies, that's great. The book wasn't proven true until years later, and so, yeah, basically for a long time they thought this whole thing was a myth, but one day they proved it and they're like, whoa, he was telling the truth, and then that book sold like hotcakes. So to sum up all of his travels, here is a map of Marco Polo's travels. I'm uh, not actually sure what's on the map because uh, I added in the maps after recording, so um. I'm assuming you can see some places and maybe some, some lines directing where he went. Um, it, it, it's probably helpful. Okay, so that's everything about Marco Polo. So instead of ending the lecture here, Dr. T brought in a completely unrelated subject. Uh, I don't even, no, the, seriously, there is absolutely no correlation between Marco Polo and what we're about to go into, the Hundred Years' War, which is important because basically this is two lectures combined into one. Um, so yeah, thanks Dr. T. 
This war lasted from 1337 to 1453, so it should be called the 116 Years War, but that's not as catchy, is it? It was a war between England and France, and it was started by the English king Edward III, who was an important figure. Edward III wanted French lands that were English lands at some point in the past, and instead of settling the debate over a game of Mario Kart, they started a full-out war. And obviously a lot of stuff happened during this war, but we're only going to be focusing on some key events that Dr. T mentioned. The first major event was the Battle of Creasy in 1346, which you should know. The English advantage was here, and it was a battle in France, actually. And Dr. T emailed us a video about this that you probably should watch. The link is in the description. It's around 8 minutes long. The French had 20,000 men, and the English had 6,000 men. And the English had the advantage because of their longbows, which are important things. They are taller than a man and have a 200 yard range, which is which is crazy actually. Um, And the French only had crossbows. Weak! The English shot the forces of the French before they even met in the front lines. And the English also used the gunpowder that Marco Polo discovered. So, if there had to be a connection, that's the only one I can find? Um, but it's a very weak connection. They used the gunpowder in their cannons, but they didn't actually work. But uh, they were loud and scary, so it scared the French away anyway. And apparently the French also got stuck in mud, apparently. I don't know why that's important, but hey, mud is deadly, I guess. And the mercenaries that the French hired fled the scene. And so yeah, England basically won the battle in a heartbeat. The next major event was the Battle of Orleans. And it was a French advantage since they were led by Joan of Arc, who has lived from 1412 to 1431. Both the Battle of Orleans and Joan of Arc are important. She felt a call to lead a battle, and so she asked the French leaders, hey, can I lead the battle? And they were like, mm, sure, why not? And so they threw her on the battlefield. She dressed as a boy in case she got captured, and this victory gave her the nickname the Maid of Orleans. So, who's the Maid of Orleans? Joan of Arc is. She never actually fought in any battle, though. She was more of like the planner who planned out the battles. But she had many successes and became a French heroine, but then a mean French bully betrayed them and turned Joan in. Mmm, so mean. England had a trial where they accused Joan of being a witch because they couldn't think of anything better, I guess. And they asked her trick questions like the Pharisees did to Jesus. They were like, hey, we're going to be super sneaky. We're going to give her trick questions so that no matter what she says, we can accuse her. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Welcome to Impressions on Conus Crash Course. <laughs> One of the questions was, are you in God's grace? This was a trick question because saying yes is impossible since no one can be sure if they're in God's grace, but saying no basically condemns yourself. But her answer was, if I am not, then God put me there. If I am, then God keep me there. Oh, she's one smart cookie. Um, so yeah, they couldn't get it on that one, but the Old Testament had a verse saying for girls not to dress as boys, apparently. And Thomas Aquinas, if you remember him from last week, commented on the verse that it had exceptions, like if it was to save your life, which in this case it was, but no one told them that, so they burned her to the stake at 19 years old. The French king never actually defended Joan or commented on her death, they kind of just ignored it, but later the case was retried and she was found to be innocent, apparently, so they made her a saint, which I, I guess that's fair because there's very much no evidence that she was a witch, I don't even know where they got that from. However, the Hundred Years War was interrupted in 1348 by the Black Plague, very important here. It hit everywhere in Europe and killed around half of Europe's population or maybe a third, I I've heard both. It was very deadly. It could kill you within the day you caught it. Nowhere was safe. Trust no one. Sorry, I like Gravity Falls. It was believed that rats caused the plague, but it was actually fleas. And guess what? Dr. T has another video that he wants us to watch about the Black Plague, and this one's 20 minutes long, so better get your popcorn ready. Uh, the link is in the description. Eventually, the plague vanished after some years. No one really knows why, but there are a bunch of rumors about it. Many bodies had to be buried afterwards, though, and so they got people to bury the bodies, and their clothes were turned into paper. For the printing press, I believe. I, I just remember that off the top of my head. I had I didn't have that written in my notes. I just think I remember Dr. T talking about how they used paper for the printing press. I, am I right? I think I'm right. Let me know in the comments if I'm right. So that's the end of the video. Be sure to take your own notes. Don't just use these videos and leave any questions you have in the comments along with the word polo. I want to see how many polos we can get. So yeah, that's the end of the video. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching and <laughs> I hope you're happy. See ya, girly pops.